Is it recording? Yes. Okay. All right. So again, welcome to the Around the World Library Tour uh, 2022 hosted by the ALA Student Chapter. We're so thankful to have received funding from the SJSU Associated Students to purchase and give away a limited amount of custom designed tote bags. After the event, we'll be sending out a Google form for all attendees to enter their name and address that they would like the bag to be sent to. I will be referencing the list of emails that you use to register for the event. Um, all information will be confidential and will only be used for the giveaway. No personal information will be saved after. You must use your SGSU email and be a current student to be eligible. The address that you would like the tote bag to be sent to must be in the United States. PO box should be fine, but at the moment shipping to Canada requires additional cost. And since we're on a very tight budget, we ask that you only use uh, US addresses. So if you know someone in um, the US um, who would be fine um, holding onto your tote bag if you were selected, that's totally fine. Winners will be selected through a random generator and will be contacted via their SJSU email if they have won. Um, if you have any additional questions about the giveaway, please save them until after the event, and I'll be more than happy to stay and answer as best as I can. And also a big, big shout out to um, tonight's co-host, Samantha, who is the one that designed the tote bag. So round of applause for her. <laughs> All righty, so <laughs> as your tour guide for our trip around the world, I don't know if you can see, but as I said, we're on a very tight budget. So this is my little tour guide hat. Um, hopefully it shows it correctly on your screen, but I would like to remind you all to have your tickets ready and to please fasten your seatbelts as we make our first stop um, around, as we make our way up to our first stop on this international tour to Ethiopia's Abrot Grand Library. So this is located in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and it officially opened on January 1st, 2022, less than a year ago. So it's very, very recent. Uh, according to uh, Abrot is the Amharic word for Amharinia Nini Enlightenment, and according to UNESCO, the literary literary rate for the country's population ages 15 and up is only about 51 percent. So this prompted the Prime Minister to build the largest library in Ethiopia and one of the largest libraries in Sri Africa. And we're also going to take a little video trip to see what the library looks like. On 1st of January. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed inaugurated a new library in Ethiopia's capital Addis Ababa. The new Addis Ababa Grand Library is a facility constructed by Addis Ababa City Administration. The plan for the construction of the library was first unveiled by the city's administration in 2019, and it involved the construction of a new library on a 38,687 square meters land in the Parliament Building about three kilometers, 1.8 miles from the sea. Alrighty, so we're going to head over to our next destination, but before we do, we have a little quiz time. So can you guess what country this library is located in? Hint, it's a country in South Asia. You can put your answers in the chat below. Samantha, are you able to read the chat answers? I am. Let's see here. We've got Thailand, India, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, the Philippines, Nepal. Okay. Awesome. Well, I did hear one of the correct answers. Um, let's 
So if you get Sri Lanka, you would be right. So this library is located in Andhapusa, Sri Lanka, and it arose out of the project titled Post-War Collective Community Library and Social Recuperation in Andhapusa, Sri Lanka. It was designed by the architect Melinda Patiraja and was built by soldiers and unskilled workers. They decided to make the library out of rammed earth walls and recycled materials as it, would only, as it would not only reduce costs and their ecological footprint, but also because the people who were physically building the library were not trained on how to build the library. So the architect wanted to make it easy for people to build um, and for them to learn new skills. So we're gonna do a little interview and tour of this library. This building is built by the soldiers uh, of the Singha Regiment in Ambepus for the use of the soldiers as well as for the local community, especially school children who live in the area. Uh, and because it is built by the soldiers, we had to design it in such a way that it can be built by unskilled workers because soldiers are not trained craftsmen. So the technological system uh, had to have a latitude for errors as opposed to being um, sensitive and, and precise in their application. So they inherently had to be robust. Building design relies a lot on the repetition of building systems for ease of construction as well as for ease of training. And the idea was to create a prototype building system which can be replicated across the other parts of the country to build similar libraries as well. I guess it's a bit like the railway station nearby, which is a prototype building. And the railway station has given us a lot of clues on how to organize the building system-wise. But the thing is that the systems needed to be flexible and adaptable to tolerate different material possibilities as well as labor skills. This library building is a collective effort involving Girl of the Regiment, Center Commandant, and all ranks. An important feature is soldiers themselves building. Apita pustakaalya tigun na hai, then apita lasan na pustakaalya tiye na, ek apne adya apne ata godat prarjana. This building won the Halsim Silver Award for Sustainable Construction from Lafarge Halsim Foundation because I think that they considered the building has responded to their five target issues of sustainability. The building tries to respond to the place in a sympathetic manner. It acknowledges people, both who use the building as well as who build the building. It responds to the planet in a, in a positive manner through a series of environmentally friendly design solutions. It uses resources strategically and uh, it is economically viable as well as it's transferable.
So now let's hop back, hop back on our plane, or in the case of this GIF or GIF plane, as we head west to our next destination and visit the Presidential Library of Turkey or the Millet Library, located in the capital city of Ankara, opened its doors on February 20th, 2020. As a depository library, it houses over 2 million printed books, 2 million periodicals, and seats up to 5,500 patrons at one time. For those of you who don't know, a depository library is a library designated by law to receive without charge all or a selection of the official publications of the government, which you'll see another example of later in this presentation. This is the Millet Library, the largest in Turkey and located in the presidential complex in Ankara. Millet has two meanings in Turkish. One of them is nation. The second and more interesting one in this case is a group of people who share common interests. And that's pretty much the idea behind this library complex. The presidential library has four million books and more than half a million e-books. And this section is called Cihan Numa Hall, featuring the World Library. It has a collection of 200,000 books on culture and history from 100 different countries in 134 languages. Some of them were donated by those countries, such as this rare copy of the Quran, which was gifted by the president of Uzbekistan. The architectural structure of the library is unique. It was not inspired directly by any other library. But of course, some elements like the dome may be similar to other famous libraries. The structure has its own characteristics. For example, there are 16 columns in this hall that represent 16 Turk states. This presidential library also serves as a prominent archive and museum. We opened two biggest book exhibitions ever held in Turkey. One of them was the exhibition of the most valuable rare books. Downstairs, open to visitors, we have Kashgarlı Mahmut's Lugati Divan Al Turk. And that book has never been made available to the public. So why is it so special? Here is a copy of the first dictionary of Turkic languages. It was first published a thousand years ago. I heard about it in school, and it's pretty amazing to meet it in person. Next to this are decrees from Ottoman sultans, and there are archival materials on display. Among them is the six-meter-long calligraphy by Sultan Mahmud II. This is a library and also a community center where people get to meet authors and scientists. Young people can attend workshops about natural and technological science and get a chance to learn from academicians in these fields. Okay, another quiz time. Can you guess what library this is? Answers down in the chat below. Samantha, would you be down to read out the answers again? Not a problem. So far, we've got the Library of Congress, Presidential Library in Ankara. Mm -hmm. NARA or Library of Congress. Library of Congress. <laughs> mm -hmm. Other ones? National Archives. That's okay. Okay. I know the uh, flag kind of gives it away <laughs> in the middle. <laughs> it that. Um, but if you guess the Library of Congress, you are correct, but it's more specifically the Thomas Jefferson building. So if you guess that or you thought of that, then you'll get an extra gold star, which I don't have with me, but <laughs> give yourself a pat on the back. Um, so this library is located in Washington, D.C. The LLC, for short, is the second largest library in the world, just behind the British Library. Uh, the LLC is comprised of three buildings, with the main one being the Jefferson Building. The other two are the John Adams Building and the James Madison Building. They also have a conserva uh, conservation center in Virginia. 
And the LLC is currently headed by Dr. Carla Hayden, who is the 14th Librarian of Congress. And she is both the first African-American person and first woman to hold office since the library's establishment in April 1800. So over two, two centuries, over two centuries. And we'll be getting a little tour of this video. This From the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. The Library of Congress was established by an act of Congress in 1800 when our nation's capital was moved from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. In August of 1814, the Capitol building, which housed the library, was burned by British troops during the War of 1812. And the library's core collection of 3,000 volumes was lost. Within a month, Thomas Jefferson offered his personal library as a replacement. Congress accepted and paid nearly $24,000 for 6,487 books, which more than doubled the size of the original collection. The library's collections have continued to grow. Librarian of Congress Ainsworth Rand Spofford promoted the passage of the copyright law of 1870 which required all copyright applicants to send the library two copies of their work. The library is still the home of the U.S. Copyright Office, and the majority of items in the Library of Congress's collections are received through the copyright registration process. In 1873, plans began for a new building. In 1886, the plans were approved, and what is now called the Thomas Jefferson Building opened in November 1897. The library now occupies three buildings on Capitol Hill. The original building, now called the Jefferson Building, the John Adams Building, built in 1938, and the James Madison Memorial Building, which was completed in 1981. The Library of Congress is the largest federal cultural institution. It houses more than 150 million items. More than 36 million of these are catalog books and other printed materials, representing more than 470 languages. Many people think that the library contains mostly books, and it does have many books. However, the library also houses vast collections of other items, such as maps, sheet music, photographs and prints, sound recordings, motion pictures, and manuscripts. The manuscripts total nearly 70 million and include original copies of some of the greatest handwritten treasures of American history and culture. Among these are Thomas Jefferson's original rough draft of the Declaration of Independence, George Washington's first inaugural address, and Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. The library has more than 20 reading rooms, 850 miles of bookshelves, 3 million recordings, and six million pieces of sheet music. The collections are constantly growing. The library receives about 15,000 items a day and about 12,000 items are added to the collections each day. That's more than two million items a year. Items not selected for the collections or other internal purposes are used in the library's national and international exchange programs. When its doors opened to the public in 1897, the Library of Congress represented an unparalleled national achievement, the largest, costliest, and safest library in the world. Its elaborately decorated interior, embellished by works of art from nearly 50 American painters and sculptors, linked the United States to classical traditions of learning and simultaneously flexed American cultural and technological muscle. This view of the Great Hall is from the second floor South Corridor and shows the elaborate ceiling and floor designs. This is a view of the main reading room in the Thomas Jefferson Building. Anyone 16 or older and with a photo ID can register as a reader and access materials from the Library of Congress on site. The Library of Congress is grand and inspiring, but you don't have to go there to search the treasures of the institution. The library's website offers millions of digitized items, all for free and without registration.
All right, so now we'll be moving on to the second half of this tour. I'm so excited to be introducing Sasha Dowdy. Um, she was my previous internship boss, Sasha Mentor, and I'm so thankful for having her here tonight. Um, before I pass the microphone on to her, I do want to provide a little bit of her background. Um, so Sasha Dowdy is the program specialist and head of literary programming for children and teens in the Library of Congress's Center for Learning, Literacy, and Engagement specifically the Literary Initiatives team. She plays an integral part in the planning of the National Book Festival and author programs throughout the year. Sasha has a Bachelor's of Arts in Japanese and a Master's in Library Science from the University of Maryland, College Park. She was born in Russia and grew up in Tokyo until age 12. She loved teaching Japanese, but didn't want to go into education. So she focused on her love of reading books for kids and specifically how books can help kids connect with as well as participate in the world. She prefers audiobooks to other types of reading, has two dogs and a pet tortoise, and her professional goal is to someday have an overnight login at the library. Everyone, please give a warm round of applause to Sasha Depp. See me okay? Can you hear me okay? Nice to meet you all. I'm gonna assume that means that you can all hear me okay. Oh, thank you, I feel very welcome. And I love the tour around the world, Yuri. That was a really good time. All right, um, as you can see, it looks different, but so I don't like this picture, but it's fine. I, um, I've been at the library for six years and I've been program specialist the whole time. And I have uh, worked with children the entire time that I was at the library. And if you all have any questions about how I got here, happy to tell you. Um, I also recently moved to a new team, like you already explained, the Literary Initiatives team. And this is the part of the library that connects our audiences to books and contemporary literature and these kinds of um, very new ideas. Uh, you saw in our presentation that Sorry, that's my child. You saw in my pre in the uh, video that we are kind of a museum, kind of an archive, kind of everything. So it's an opportunity to show that we live in this millennium, in this century. So I like that very much. Um, our, and uh, I saw a few of you say in chat, like, is this NARA, is it LOC? And we get asked that all the time. And you saw a little bit of it in the video, but uh, what I, an easy way to know the distinction is that we house America's creativity. So it can look like anything. It can look like the back of an envelope that Rosa Parks wrote a pancake recipe on, and it might be a scrap of paper of this and uh, Carl Sagan's doodles or um, a little bit of, um, quick dash uh, from the um, person who created Rent and doing some math. Uh, the person's name is not coming to me. So musical people, please come in and uh, write in the chat. But I, yeah, they calculated the number of minutes in a year and we have that in our collections. We also have weird stuff like hair and jewelry. And thank you very much, Sabrina. See, I knew there would be musical people in here. Um, so we have amazing things and you know we have 3,500 flutes and everything that you can imagine, every way that you can record creativity. And NARA is the official record keeper of the United States. So everything that officials do, um, everything that we do in the library that, I know my hair is really weird, everything that we do in the library that shows our work or official decisions made by leadership go to NARA. Um, and a really specific example is that the Declaration of uh, Independence, we have the draft and NARA has the official document. Um, it's really fun because the draft uses the word subjects. And then um, with technology, we, will, we were able to uncover that because citizens is the word that you will currently see in the declaration. Uh, so we have lots of science and things like that. Uh, we once made this um, card catalog drawer full of jobs that no, no competition. 
um, we once made a drawer and then a little card catalog for kids to look at the variety of jobs available at the library. And it goes from artists who work in conservation to um, audio and voice actors uh, who work in the National Library Service for the blind and print disabled. And um, there's just all kinds of jobs that can lead to the library. Yeah, we also have uh, gardeners. Uh, that's the uh, architects of the Capitol who make the area look beautiful. They even have a vegetable garden. And um, I, it just never ceases to amaze me, the fact that we do so many things and I occupy like this much of it. Sometimes people tell me that it's very um, intimidating to even be face to face with this kind of institution. Um, but I like to think about it as being on the beach and tipping your toe in. And we will never know the extent of the entire ocean, but it's kind of fun to look at it from where we are. All right, Ori, can we go to the next one, please? <laughs> so as you know already, this is the Thomas Jefferson Building and the circle is where my office is right now, not to brag, but it is a temporary place where I live with my coworkers. Um, we are a team of five. Um, my boss is Clay Smith, who is a literary director. He came over from Texas. Anybody from Texas, give us a little shout out because we are happy to have fo folks from outside of the DC area join us. Um, I'm also working with Rob Casper, who is a poetry specialist, and he is head of the poetry part of our division. Anya Kreitney, who uh, I'll show you works on the literary ambassadors, and Desiree Arnaz, who um, incredible person who just knows how to keep data in her head on the computer and just keep things working. It's amazing. And the National Book Festival uh, website, if you see it, has basically been built by her, and that's our little team. I, oh, I wanted to make a couple of corrections to the video. Oh, no, no, it's not corrections, it's updates. Uh, it's constantly, the collection numbers keep growing and we have 173 million items, about 51 million books, about 170,000 comic books, um, about 3 million maps, I think. It might be more and just endless ways to record creativity. And I think you learned in the video or you already know that it's the home of copyright. So we really value the Americans intellectual property. Uh, although half of the material, more than half the material in the library's collections is not in English. We represent about 470 languages. So um, information from all around the world is important to us and to share. Something that I think is important to know about the library is that we don't live in the past and the library seems like it's a little dusty, musty, full of old crumbling things. And there are definitely some incredibly historically important but crumbling things. And we really want people to know our story is that it's continuing from where we were Thomas Jefferson days and uh, living in the actual Capitol building to now where we want the library to be contemporary and up to date with what's going on, not only in the literary world, but also the museum world and partnering with other, other cultural organizations with us and just outreach to the public, including kids. Uh, so the next slide shows you two of the ambassadors that we have at the library. Uh, this is, what my team works on, it's very cool. And I help out a little bit with Jason Reynolds, but uh, the Poet Laureate program is at the Library of Congress. And yes, Billy Mom is our newest Poet Laureate who just had an inauguration in September. Uh, and you can watch that video on YouTube. She's really wonderful in that she represents a lot of firsts, but instead of being like, a Latina woman. She says she wants to be seen as a poet and as a person who just doesn't represent anybody but herself, which was kind of cool. And her job is to just show that poetry lives here at the library and does outreach to the community. 
and Jason Reynolds is our national ambassador for young people's literature. He is uh, at the tail end of his third year. Usually the ambassadors serve two years, but pandemic. So it was really cool that he did third year. He was able to pivot and do a lot of online activities for kids. The right, 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 each one spelled like differently. Um, and I can link to that too. Uh, it was really a great platform for him. Um, the platform is called Grab the Mic, Tell Your Story. And Right, Right, Right is a small part of it in which he put a bunch of uh, prompts online on YouTube and people would do those like write a letter to your favorite celebrity or write a biography of yourself if you became famous and stuff like that. Um, lots of really good interaction that we had with him. Um, he is going to have an outgoing goodbye ceremony in December. I'm very excited because no national ambassador has ever done that before. They've never gotten a closing celebration. So Jason's going to get that. And we're since he's a DC native, we're going to see him off with some go-go music. So very exciting. And our next poet laureate will be, no, not a poet laureate. Our next ambassador for young people's literature will be announced in January. And um, very excited about this person, but I can't tell you yet. I hope you tune in if you are a children's literature person. I saw a question about, oh, using my Japanese degree. I use it sometimes. My, I volunteer every July for a nerdy convention called Otakon, and it's Japanese pop culture, manga, anime, music, some K-pop stuff that's coming in. Yes. And since I have the Japanese background, I am an escort interpreter for these guests from Japan. And I love it. It's super fun. And how it relates to the library is that we had a partnership two years in a row called Anime for All. And we combined the collections that we have with some of the contemporary imagery you see in manga and anime. So we had like this really cool scroll of a um, full detailed katana from the 14th century. And we had some drawings um, and some drafts of really famous Japanese artworks. We had female samurai and male samurai to show off the connection to samurai shampoo and just tons of other things, which was super fun. And uh, there was even a blog post that my colleague wrote about Usagi Yojimbo um, that's, um, bunny <laughs> yes uh a bunny uh samurai and all about the other types of samurai that live in our collections i get to connect these two things these contemporary love for pop culture with the collections and that was one of the best outreach programs that i've done uh, with collaboration of about six different departments all across the library I really like this ability to connect to contemporary items. We want to show that the library is accessible, it's usable, and it can be used to continue the cycle of creativity into today. Priori, let's go to the next one. One of the biggest things that I now work on now that I'm on the literary initiative team, initiatives team is the National Book Festival. I've slowly been working a little more and a little more on it uh, in the years that I've been here, but this is the year that I got to plan most of the children's and teen stages, which is incredible. And you are seeing the main stage presentation with the five out of six authors of Blackout, which is an anthology about Black teen love and joy that they wrote together. And it's an incredible group. Um, Tiffany D. Jackson, who is next to Dr. Carla Hayden in purple. Uh, Tiffany writes books. Yeah, and there's Dr. Hayden. She is very small and very mighty. Um, Tiffany Jackson does these psychologically torturous books, like allegedly, and Monday's Not Coming. And Nick Stone, she wrote a bunch of um, a series like Dear Martin. Um, we have Ashley Woodfolk, and I don't want to dwell too much, Danielle Clayton and Nicola Yoon, who likes to be called Nikki. So this uh, was one of three stages that we live streamed on this day. 
we want people to come on site to, yes. Um, it came out on the 8th and we just had them at the Library of Congress and Angie Thomas did not, um, she was gonna attend the National Book Festival and didn't, but she actually came to this whiteout event, which was very cool. Uh, we, were, we love people to come on site to the, not to the Library of Congress itself, but the convention center in DC and connect with us. We had about 40,000 people come to National Book Festival this year. And we had, I don't have the final numbers, but definitely tens of thousands of people uh, joined us online to watch the live streams of the young adult, pay, young adult stage, main uh, stage that you're seeing here um, and society and culture stage. So that was pretty cool. Each one of us on the team of five was responsible for two stages each, which worked out. Um, I had a great time and we were able to do pretty extensive surveys about attendees of the library's national book festival in history it's been a bit of a it attracted a lot of older whiter more educated people and this year those statistics started to flip and in the past we had zero point something percent of teens and this year we had seven percent incredibly exciting. We have a closer percentage of uh, the Black population of DC. It went from uh, six to 15%, which is still not where we want to be, but definitely closer. Um, and we welcomed a lot of new um, people in terms of education or uh, race, ethnicity, um, age, and I was really proud, not that I did all of it, but it's really important to represent these diverse stories. It's kind of the thing that I bring to work the most in that these old collections are extremely important to tell us the story, but what about all those who were sidelined and those who did a lot of work and weren't represented and uh, people who just didn't have the ability to record their story? This is our chance to continue that work of recording what's happening in front of us, witnessing the creativity that occurs in front of us and to record it, to try not to allow for these narratives from people who've been marginalized or disenfranchised to be represented as part of our nation's history. So that was really important when considering the authors we invited to the National Book Festival. All right, let's do the next one, Yuri. Um, this is, you, you probably know, maybe if you have any kind of young kid in your life or you've been to the kids section at the library near you. Um, this is, should I give you a chance to tell me who that is? <laughs> I'll take a water break. Yes, exactly. That's Steve Pilkey, author of Dogman and Captain Underpants series. Uh, he, we welcomed him and about 500 children in the morning and 600 children at night to help launch one of the newest books. This is right before pandemic. That's why he's high-fiving every single kid who is leaving the auditorium. But it is really important for us to not only show that these stories matter to us. Um, like I was talking about before with the um, lineup of our authors, but to physically welcome kids to the space. You saw in the video that you have to be 16 to order uh, to be eligible for a reader's card. And that's very much true, which makes people not want to bring their kids to us, but we are partly a museum and we have a space for young kids to touch books because um, you don't get to see that in the Thomas Jefferson building. And it's a big passion of mine to bring it kids to the library. Uh, this year, uh, and by year, I mean this semester, I guess, starting in September, we welcomed Nikki Giovanni uh, with her book, A Library, a very sweet, lovely book. Uh, we've had um, Dr. Tommy Smith, who uh, is famous for his um, stand um, in the 19... 64 Olympics, the fists in the air, he came with his new graphic novel. We had a lot of kids here in the morning and at nighttime. 
you know, Whiteout, like I mentioned, we had our auditorium full of teens. And um, another one we did was a family day on the weekend before Halloween, October 22nd. And we had Arl Stein and Mary Pope Osborne join us and have a talk. And we did some silliness with the lights and people dressed up as monsters. And they, we had a little Jack and Annie cosplayers running around. <laughs> it was fun. And now that I'm on this team, I am focused on the books. So I got to put all of my energy into the production. And I am not a person who knows um, the terms or what the lights are called or how to program them or, and I don't have much of a theater background. So it was incredible that we got to work with the music division and the producers in the multimedia group. And um, we even have a colleague who's a playwright to help us adapt some of the shenanigans and, um, I love it. Before this team, I was a little bit stretched because we run this youth space uh, for kids called Young Reader Center and Programs Lab and running the program. So it's better when you only have to wear one hat instead of seven. So that's one of our kid events. Uh, if we can go to the next one, I just wanted to show this one to highlight our teen program. We did a second year of summer internships for teens in this area and remote who joined us over four weeks uh, remotely mostly, but sometimes they came in to teach them how to interview authors, uh, to teach them how to research in the library and overall become ambassadors for the Library of Congress. And you can see that team second from the left, Ava Luo who is 15 years old in this picture. And she got to do the last 10 minutes of a panel about sequels. So you'll see um, uh, Victoria Aviard and Namina Forna and Chloe Gong having a blast. And you'll see next to uh, Ava on the other side is Austin, who was like you are an intern um, of mine. And it was, I think, year two of me working at the library. And he's now a teen librarian in a nearby county. So I had to have him come back and be our main interviewer moderator for this panel. It's great to stay in touch with the interns, like with Yuri, and really welcome everyone's talents and perspectives and skills and be able to incorporate them with the library and what we care about. Um, we go to the next one, just a quick skip to Arl <laughs> Stein and Mary Pope Osborne talking to Jack and Annie. Um, Mary is not a very big actress, <laughs> so they gave some laughs among the scary stuff that we did. I uh, just wanted you to see that we really really care about putting this online and making it available. And the new thing we started doing is editing our videos. As you can see, that one is a minute 16, uh, one hour and 16 minutes long. Uh, people don't usually sit down and watch something that long. And we've been working with interns to cut our videos together into either shorts or three to five minute things to show you what we did and get you excited about the library. And I think this is the last one you already before I kind of hand it over to you guys, I to you all. I saw in chat, there were a couple of questions that I might have uh, answered and I might not have, but I wanna see what you all wonder about and what you'd like to know. I can talk about different types of jobs. There seem to be some interest about that. Um, strategic planning and future facing projects. Um, the strategic planning was the hardest class for me when I was doing my MLS before the I was put in the MLS and the YS. Um, and it turned out to be one of the most useful things I learned. Um, resources for in-person and online research and some tips uh, about my time working with kids and teens, um, some details about working and applying for a job at the federal government, um, how I use the skills I learned with my degree. And, or we can talk about YA. 
um, and our favorite things that they do repeatedly, but it's still fun. What do you all think? A or E? E. Okay, we can hit on E and then A. So E. Working for the federal government. I interviewed for almost, uh, how many jobs have I had here? The first one, was, I was an intern. And the second one, I, I was appointed to the position in the Young Reader Center. Then, but that was a NTE, which is not to exceed. And usually it's either 120 days or six months or two years these kinds of periodic things that can be renewed if you did a good enough job, uh, but is not a guarantee. So when a job that was my job, <laughs> yes, when <laughs> my job was listed as a permanent one, it was the same grade level and the same job description, but I had to apply for it in order to have that permanent position and applying for federal jobs is a whole thing because it's a very long application process you have to do ksas which are knowledge skills and experience and you have to write like eight essays about it and your resume has to be perfectly tailored to the job so every job that you apply to you have to do its own thing um bye thanks for joining us uh, so you literally would scan the job listing and the things that they're looking for, uh, even the kind of good to have skills and put them in your resume, literally copy paste if you need to and make it yourself seem like the perfect fit. Um, I learned that people do this. Sometimes there's going to be, oh really? Yeah, there's a lot of formulaic ways and hoops to jump through. Um, they ask you like how much experience or how much comfort do you have with this skill, like journalism skills, for example, because we do a lot of writing, editing, uh, proofreading, etc. And it's like on a scale of one to five. One is like I have no experience, and five is like I'm an expert. I'm perfect. I'm amazing. And you just put five on everything. Doesn't matter if you actually are or not. And this is not the time to be modest. You actually have to put like all fives unless you have no clue what that is. Um, that was really a long process to get the job that I already had. And then two years later, we went through uh, reorganization. I joined a different team, educational outreach. Uh, so that was teacher focused work instead of working directly with kids and families. Um, didn't have a choice that was just kind of absorbed into the teacher team. And I had to apply for that job. Um, it was a bit of a promotion, so it's okay. And then this one, I applied to move from my team to this one. It's a lateral move. Uh, got the tiniest bump in pay, like one step up. And that I went to went through the entire process again. It takes me a few days to apply. So that is a little bit of a difficult thing, but I like that I have job security and health insurance and FMLA and stuff like that. Um, I don't know if you are interested in federal government work and like the nitty gritty of it, you're welcome to email me if you'd like to know more about it. Um, something I learned from my second job from the educational outreach team is that we are federal government, obviously, we are completely funded by the public or Congress, but it's taxpayer money. And we are federal agents, we serve the government, we are a nonpartisan institution. So we do not have any kinds of political opinions, although we give platforms to people to discuss their ideas and share their thoughts and books. Um, so we have to be pretty careful about that. We can't endorse things like, this is my new favorite YA. Like I can talk to Diori or something or somebody. Um, and we can of course be casual with each other and friends, but the public must never know. 
uh, specific things that we love and that other people can use to promote that thing. Um, it's been, it, it's good to work for this particular part of government because I believe in the work that we do. And I really try to make it worth the taxpayer money. And I really want people to take advantage of their taxpayer money and come to us, visit us, use our free resources. Everything we do is free. The only thing is a gift shop and books for author programs. So I really like that aspect of work too. Okay, so there was a lot of interest in A, as long as I'm not going over. Tell me or if I need to stop. But different types of jobs at the library. One of the coolest ones is voice actors and we hire local actors uh, who have a history of doing amazing things with their voice and they try out uh, to record talking books and um, audio books. Um, we have a free service to anybody who is blind or print disabled and they're able to access books in any format that works for them. So I really love that we get to work with local talent. Um, I alluded to this before, but the music division is the area of the library that owns the Coolidge Auditorium, which holds 485 seats. And they are like the backstage experts. They know how to do the lighting and they know how to do production and they can, um, they do the screens and the, um, the curtains and all kinds of things that I don't know about and they teach me as we work together. So if you have a theater background, there's a place at the library. And we have librarians like MLS, MLIS holders, but um, majority that do not work directly with collections or not. Um, it's, yeah, that's pretty cool that we get to come in at any level. Uh, another really interesting position is work for Veterans History Project, which is part of American Folk Life Center. Uh, this is a project that collects stories and items from veterans around the country of all past conflicts. So as long as a war is over, we can start collecting those veteran stories. And there are field interviewers who go out there um, into the community to record their stories. There are people who digitize uh, items that are submitted to us. We have transcribers to make those interviews accessible. And um, we of course have people that plan events with veterans as well. Yes, I will definitely give you a link to VHP, to the Veterans History Project. I'm hurrying it down before I forget. Yeah, that's really important to us. And um, fun fact that StoryCorps is our partner and they archive a lot of the stuff. Oh, we archive their stories and they help put some of ours out there, which is kind of cool. Um, what other jobs do we have? We have chemists that help do <clears throat> electrospectrometry. That word that maybe some of you know better than I do, uh, but they, uh, analyze the paper to see the best way to preserve it, or they look at the ink, they de-acidified, um, they de-acidified some of the things that were crumbling, such as our comics collection. We have the original Batman, and it was made on some of the worst imaginable paper, so of course we're working really hard to make sure that these um, priceless things don't go the way of dust and old things. All right, sounds like I hit my time, but I hope that you enjoyed and learned a little bit about the library. And um, maybe you can <laughs> use some of our resources. And I couldn't leave without sharing Lizzo in our beautiful reading room, trying out James Madison's flute. These experiences are rare, but extremely fun. I wasn't invited to this day, but um, <laughs> but I was there when we had the penguin in the main reading room, so maybe it's okay. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed. Uh, thank you all.
I think I saw a question about remote work. Sasha, would you be down to put your, uh, are you okay with people reaching out to you? Sure. Okay. I'm gonna give you my email. Veterans History Project link. Okay. So while Sasha's doing that, um, just because I want to be respectful of time for folks. Um, so thank you so much for joining us on our world tour. These are the links to our itinerary tonight. Um, I will be sending you all a PDF copy of this presentation after the event. So you'll be able to access these links. Um, these are the YouTube links as well as some additional um, library related resources. Uh, the Library of Congress, I have linked the homepage as well as internships and fellowships for folks who are interested. Some of them are remote. Um, the one that I did was completely remote, so it is possible. Um, also in the registration, when you received the email link, there was also a option for folks who were interested in other libraries. And so we just wanted to see kind of what other libraries folks were interested in. So they talked about the National Library of Medicine, Vancouver Public Library, as well as many others. And so those are library um, YouTube links to those libraries as well. Some of them also, in, I was able to find volunteer internship opportunities. So if you want to check that out, please feel free to do so. I've also included links to additional libraries because um, our tour was on a very tight budget. And so we weren't able to go all the way around the world. Um, but these are other libraries that um, you may be interested in for folks who are international. So feel free to check that out if you're ever in uh, Mexico, Japan, Amsterdam, Taiwan, Wales, or Fiji. Maybe you'll have a chance to visit those libraries and let us know what about those experiences you like. All right, and so once again, this after this event, I'll be sending out a link to the Google form for the Around the World Library Tour. The deadline to submit this form will be Sunday, November 20th at midnight. We're hoping to do another giveaway in spring with a larger budget. So just know that if you don't get an item this semester, you'll likely have another chance next semester if you're still a student. Um, and that is it for me. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And we hope to see you at our next event at the end of semester meetup on Wednesday, November 30th at 6.30 Pacific time. Take care, and if you have any questions that you want to ask me, um, feel free to stay on. But Sasha, I know that it's pretty late where you are, so if you want to pop off, you're totally free to do so. It's my bedtime. <laughs> it, I don't mind answering any questions or sharing any links, but thank you for inviting me, Ari. And no worries. I'm so glad that you were here. Clap for you.